Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Financial Coaching Network bi-monthly peer call. We are going to get started in about a minute. We're giving everyone um, just a little bit more time to sign in and get settled. So this would be a great time to grab a snack, um, run a quick um, you know, bio break, and we will start in about um, one minute. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Financial Coaching Network by monthly peer call. Before we start, I want to review a few housekeeping items with everyone. So this is a group discussion. However, all webinar attendees are muted at the um, right now at the beginning to ensure sound quality. There will be built in dialogue and discussion points throughout today's event. So um, when those times come, there's instructions here on your screen. We'll show them again. If you want to um, ask a question of one of our panelists today, you want to share your perspectives, your experiences, you can do so by pushing the hand button, raising your hand, and we'll be able to unmute you. Um, but to make sure that's able to, to happen, it's best if you call in using the telephone option and you enter in your audio pin. That's a lot, that allows us to unmute you so you can share on today's call. Otherwise, you can also type into the question box, which is on your control panel, um, which is most often starts on the right hand of your screen. So if you look for that control panel, you can chat at us at any time during today's webinar. Um, and if you experience any technical issues, you can email us at the email address on the screen, which is estuero at prosperitynow.org. My name is Fran Rose Bush Baylor, and I'm the Director of Field Engagement at Prosperity Now. I'm excited to welcome you to the Financial Coaching Network peer call today. Uh, we hope to create a space through these calls for practitioners across the country to be able to have time to connect with each other. There's over 450 practitioners registered for the Financial Coaching Network and for this call series, and our aim is to make this as valuable as a time for you as possible. Um, at the end of today's call, there will be a survey, so please um, stick around for that and let us know your thoughts and your feedback. Um, we continue to use that and incorporate your, your suggestions into these calls as we go forward. Just a quick reminder of the Financial Coaching Networks, what you know you signed up for. Um, this is a broad community of practitioners around the country who are interested and engaged in financial coaching and counseling. Uh, we seek to keep practitioners and other stakeholders informed and connected on the latest information, research, and tools available. And this is a collaborative network in nature, and it seeks part, uh, partnership of other national and local partners to design and facilitate activities. And you'll see that we've engaged one of our um, two of our national partners. Um, on, on today's call. Um, Financial Coaching Network is free. We want this to be accessible to anyone who's interested. Um, and we've also partnered with Change Machine through the Financial Clinic um, to offer Financial Coaching Network members free access to share for a full year. So um, check that out. Get involved. Um, it's an um, online community. You can talk to other Financial Coaching Network members there. And if you have any questions at all, you can email us about that at community at prosperitynow.org. A few tips to help you get the most out of today's call. Join from a quiet space, grab a coffee or snack and settle in with us. Um, we really want you to find this time valuable and we also want you to engage. Um, come ready to share your experiences and your questions related to today's topic, which is around financial technology, um, and continue to engage throughout today's call. You can send us your questions and comments as you listen. Today's agenda. 
Um, first, we'll have um, an introduction of today's peer facilitator, which is Joshua Sledge from the Center for Financial um, Services Innovation. Um, then we'll have some getting to know you. We'll do some opening poll questions of attendees um, that will be led by my, my colleague, Santi, to um, get to know a little bit more about your experiences with FinTech. And then he'll be sharing some of the results um, from the survey we sent out previously around today's topic, where we asked you all to share your experiences with, with financial technology. Um, and that we'll hear some perspectives from the field. So um, two of your peers will share their experiences with financial technology, and we'll have a panel discussion. And then we'll open up the, the floor. We'll open it up to you all to ask questions of our panelists, to ask questions of each other, and engage in a dialogue. And then we'll have some closing and next steps. So with that, I will turn it over to Joshua Sledge, who's the director of the program team at the Center for Financial Services Innovation, and has been a wonderful partner of Prosperity Now, um, working with us um, through the uh, Prosperity Now has been participating in CFSI's nonprofit FinTech working group, and it's been such a pleasure to get to know you more, Josh. So thank you for being with us today. Hi. Thanks a lot, Fran, and thank you to everyone at Prosperity Now for the opportunity to, to share it today. I'm really uh, looking forward to today's conversation and looking forward to hearing from everyone on the line as well. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, I'll give a, a brief overview of my organization in case you may not be familiar. Um, the Center for Financial Services Innovation is a national nonprofit. We're based in Chicago. Uh, our mission is to improve the financial health of Americans, American households, uh, especially the underserved. Um, and you know, hear me say financial health probably about 100 times today, but we define that pretty simply as having a day-to-day -day financial system that works well and enables you to build resilience to financial shocks and pursue whatever opportunities are most important to you. If you want to retire or buy a home, um, put your kids through college, whatever the life you want to live, um, do you have the financial health and capability to do that? At the core of our work, we lead a network of financial services providers that are committed to building better products and programs aimed at improving financial health. And this really runs the gamut all the way from uh, large national banks to small community banks and credit unions, nonprofit organizations, FinTech startups, uh, academic groups, card networks, really anyone that is engaged in helping people to better manage their money. We work with them and try to provide them with connections um, through our network and, and events and, and to facilitate peer learning and partnership opportunities amongst that group. We also conduct research to better understand the financial challenges that families are facing and highlight the opportunities we see to solve them. Uh, we have a consulting practice that lets us roll up our sleeves and work with some of our partners to develop new products and strategies. Uh, and lastly, we have an innovation arm where we invest in and support leading fintech startups and nonprofits that are creating new and innovative solutions for improving financial health. Uh, I'll share a, a little bit more about this pillar of work and the potential we see in FinTech innovation. Uh, but before I do, I thought it'd be helpful for us to look at some of the broader trends that we see when it comes to growing the potential of FinTech as a tool. Uh, if you go to the next slide here. Um, so you'll hear me say FinTech a, a number of times today. We define that pretty broadly. It's really anybody that's applying technological innovation uh, to design or deliver financial products or services. Uh, this and, and tools as well. So this could be uh, for-profit fintech startups, you know, what you think of when you think about those in Silicon Valley creating new apps or tools, as well as nonprofit organizations, many of which we've seen have, have become very adept and um, uh, um, efficient at, at creating tools uh, that uh, speak to the needs of, of underserved consumers. Um, so, you know, this, uh, the growing potential of, of FinTech as a tool for supporting LMI and underserved households really comes from the notion that technology generally is becoming more accessible and increasingly we turn to online channels or our mobile phones uh, to conduct business and just manage our day-to-day -day lives. This slide here shows that a growing share of LMI households have access to mobile and smartphones, even though their rates of ownership still lag behind that of, of higher income groups. If you look at the lowest income bracket, those that are making $25,000 and less, um, nearly 60% of these households have a mobile phone with about three quarters of those being smartphones. And at the same time, when you look at smartphone owners as a whole, 
we see typically underserved populations, including younger people, uh, low and moderate income consumers, people of color, they are actually the most likely to utilize mobile banking services. So more and more we're seeing that people across the income spectrum have the ability to access information, to make transactions, and communicate using a device in their pocket. So there's enormous potential here to use these capabilities to help people better manage their money and pursue their financial goals. And we see that a wave of fintech innovators is emerging and they're all looking to fulfill that promise. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so in seeing this energy and the opportunity behind the fintech space, uh, we saw the need to catalyze and support fintech innovators that were really catering to the needs of underserved consumers and really looking at this question of financial health. So in 2015, CFSI launched the Financial Solutions Lab initiative. This is a, a $30 million five-year initiative that's managed by CFSI with our founding partner, JP Morgan Chase. Uh, and the goal is to identify, test, and bring to scale some of these promising innovations uh, that we see um, that are helping Americans to save, to improve credit, and to build assets. So the way it works is that we each year run an innovation challenge where we go out to the marketplace looking for emerging um, companies or, or organizations or solutions that are um, uh, uh, really uh, uh, um, helping people to improve their financial health, better manage their money. Uh, and we try to provide uh, the ones that we select, usually a cohort of about eight to 10, uh, with some of the, the, the best possible combination of incentives and resources, a connection to some of these uh, advisors and, and counseling agencies we see here that may be able to help them with setting up legal compliance or improving their technology or thinking about partnership opportunities. Um, we work with these firms in, in, the, the, um, in supporting the, the companies that come into the uh, Financial Solutions Lab cohort, all with the goal of helping them get from point A to point B, where they are really growing. Um, they've got a refined product and, and are reaching more people with a solution uh, that's really going to have a positive impact in their lives. So on the next slide, um, you'll see a, an overview of all the companies that we've selected. So we've gone through three challenges thus far each year. Uh, we pulled together a cohort of eight to 10 innovators, and uh, including mostly for-profit in enterprises, a few nonprofit organizations um, we, we worked with as well. Uh, we're getting ready to launch our fourth year of the challenge this month. And uh, you can see you know, across the board here, um, these innovators are solving for a number of challenges that are, are faced by many underserved consumers, including increasing savings, uh, helping to manage volatile incomes, avoiding overdraft fees, uh, building and repairing credit, just to name a few. So, uh, you know, these tech-enabled financial tools out there are used by, by these and other uh, tech-enabled financial tools are used by many other consumers. Um, there are other things like Mint, Credit Karma, Venmo, other, other tools that people are, are, are using to um, uh, become a part of their financial lives and help them better manage their money. So if you go to the next slide, you know, not only do we have all the, the FinLab companies and, and all these other solutions out there, you know, we see that there's a lot of promise, but there's still more that needs to be done to ensure that the energy and investments in the FinTech field are leading to the creation of products that are designed to meet the needs of underserved consumers and that are actually being delivered to, 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 um, to, to reach them. So this is where we see the potential for partnerships between the FinTech community and, and nonprofit organizations. You know, many nonprofits, including many of you on the call, are working directly in underserved communities. You're building trusted relationships in order to understand and then address your clients' financial challenges. And because of these strong relationships and the deep knowledge and insights of the needs of your clients, um, in particular financial coaches, you can play a key role in influencing the development of FinTech tools and connecting people with the tools that can really work best for them. At the same time, you see that there's this, this uh, cohort and, and, and group of fintech providers that are leveraging mobile and online technology to create new products and tools uh, to help people more easily manage their financial lives. And they're looking for ways to expand their reach uh, to, to reach the people that need it the most. So we believe that between fintech providers and or direct service organizations uh, offer the potential to create really powerful, a really powerful combination of innovative technology tools and supportive related trusted partners and this is all being done with the goal of building financial health so with that idea in mind of the potential of these partnerships we launched last year the fintech nonprofit partnerships working group this is again sponsored by the financial solutions lab uh, but the goal is to explore and facilitate partnerships between direct service nonprofit organizations and fintech providers. So the working group pulls together both, you know, representatives from both of these communities uh, and tries to create a marketplace for fostering partnerships 
an opportunity for people to participate in peer learning, um, and, a, an op and a vehicle to document best practices for these types of partnerships that actually move the needle on financial health. Now, Prosperity Now has been a really important partner in CFSI's exploration of the potential of the FinTech nonprofit partnership. This goes back to 2016 when we first uh, hosted a webinar and, and um, uh, developed a session for the Assets Learning Conference to really discuss the opportunity for these kinds of partnerships. Um, to drive FinTech entry within the nonprofit community, working together now uh, to have these types of conversations that I'm hoping we'll have today, to learn more about where you see opportunities, where you see challenges, where you see concerns and think about how CFSI and Prosperity Now uh, can work together to help you overcome them and really tap into the potential uh, of leveraging some of the emerging fintechs. I'm excited to be here today to keep the conversation going. And again, I'm looking forward to hearing more from you. Uh, on the next slide here, um, we're also very fortunate to be joined by two fintech innovators that are working with nonprofit organizations to both develop and deliver solutions that improve the financial health of underserved consumers. So we have Yadi Yance, who's a co-founder and CMO of Lamondo, which offers a zero-fee prepaid debit card and complimentary financial management tools. And the company is currently working to expand its portfolio of financial services. And we also have Megan Kersick, the Assistant Director of Partnership Management at the Financial Clinic. Um, the Financial Clinic built the change machine platform that's right here. It's a tool built to support financial coaches and increase the efficiency and impact of their work. So we'll hear more from Yadi and Megan a bit later, but I'll first turn things back to Santi to keep us moving along with our agenda. Santi? All right. Thanks, Josh. I really appreciate that. And before I get going into my section, I just wanted to give, you know, you and CFSI a shout out, but also Shaheen um, Hassan, who couldn't be here with us today, who put a lot of work into the survey, into the preparation for this uh, presentation. Um, so as Josh said, so I'm Santiago Suero for everybody on the call. I'm a pro program associate here at the uh, Prosperity Now on the Savings and Financial Capability team. And I'm going to uh, start with a little bit of a warm-up. So I'm going to go through some poll questions to get to know you, get to know uh, the audience and who's on the call. And then I'll get into the survey results. Um, yeah, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so first, uh, we want to start with the first poll question. So this is for everybody in the audience. Uh, please let us know uh, what your experience, uh, level of experience with FinTech is. Um, so if you're a beginner, um, if you're intermediate, uh, less two to three years or advanced four plus years, you're an expert on FinTech, you know, um, everything that's out there, or you've, you've adopted a FinTech product, you've been working it, with it on it for a long time, please, please let us know. So we'll give you a couple more seconds and uh, we'll share the results. All right, so we have about 70% of you who are uh, beginners, uh, so less than a year of, of experience. 20% of you have intermediate experience, and a uh, few of you, 10%, have advanced uh, experience. So that's that's fine. So that's good. We're gonna have a, a lot of content, and that you know, for everybody on this call, um, especially for beginners, and that was a big uh, theme in the survey that um, that we disseminated and we collected the answers. So um, we have a lot to go through, and hopefully, a lot that uh, will be useful to you. All right. So moving on to the next poll. Uh, so just take a few seconds to let us know what your role is in your organization, whether you're senior leadership, uh, program management, frontline staff or uh, if this doesn't fit um, you know, your title or your role, uh, uh, then let us know in the chat box uh, what, you, you know, what your role is. So take a few seconds to answer and then we'll uh, keep going. All right, 
So we see here about 8% of you are uh, senior leadership, 40 a majority of you are uh, program management, 33% of you are frontline staff, and 19% answered other. Um, and I see we have financial literacy officers and uh, some financial coaches and, and uh, that kind of role. So that's great. Thank you. All right, next poll. Um, so give us a sense of uh, what financial need you would like a FinTech product to address. So um, whether or not you're already uh, uh, providing a FinTech product, that's okay. Um, we would ask you to envision yourself, you know, just for a moment for the sake of this exercise to um, provide a FinTech product. What would you want, what need would you want that FinTech product to address? Um, so go ahead and, and uh, take a few seconds to respond there and please select all that apply. Okay, so we see that um, we have 74% of you uh, say that your client's need is increased savings. 72% of you say that your client's need is to build or repair credit score. 57% of you uh, say that managing personal consumption is a high need, and 63% of you say building financial knowledge. So there's there's a uh, you know uh, multiple needs here uh, for clients, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to. Um, you know, uh, lift up some products and talk about some uh, product design that, you know, we take into account when we're thinking about uh, delivering products or adopting products that meet those needs. Okay, uh, next poll. So let's see right here. And this is the last one. So um, tell us about specific challenges that you face with providing FinTech products to clients. Um, so, you know, if, if this also applies whether or not you're uh, providing a product, but if you would provide a product, you know, is there a lack of information? Are you still learning about FinTech or um, is your organization unfamiliar with FinTech and, and you need to gather information? Have you not found, you, have you done a little bit of research, but you still haven't found the right FinTech product? Maybe you're considering uh, a handful of options. Um, or is there a lack of organizational capacity? So um, hopefully uh, we'll be able to talk a little bit more about these later. Um, and uh, if you have a, a different uh, challenge, please go ahead and type that into the chat box. So take a few more seconds and we'll close the poll and show you the results. All right, so we see that uh, a number of you, 52%, say that you lack information about what products are available. Um, and 55%, so similarly, so that's on the individual basis, but also at the organizational level, um, organizationally, 55% of you say you're unfamiliar with FinTech. 43% of you say that you haven't found the right FinTech product. So maybe you're aware of a few, but you haven't found the right one. And 34% of you say that you lack the organizational capacity, and 14% uh, say other. Okay. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move on. And uh, thank you so much for doing that. So now, um, you know, we just wanna do that to get do a little bit of warm up, uh, see what your challenges are, uh, see what you're thinking, and see who's on the call, um, so that, you know, hopefully we can have a good discussion. And in the meantime, we're gonna, I'm gonna switch gears now into the survey learning objectives. And I'll just remind everybody to, Go ahead and while you know um, I'm talking and sharing these survey results, uh, feel free to ask any questions, ask us if there's anything that's unclear, if there are any terms that you want us to elaborate on, um, to type that into the question, <clears throat> excuse me, the questions box. All right, so um, we developed the survey in conjunction with uh, the C CFSI 
And uh, we set out to, um, we disseminated the survey through the Financial Coaching Network and a handful of you uh, were able to um, reply to that and give us some really interesting information. I want to talk a little bit about what our learning objectives were going into this. Um, you know, we had before uh, uh, CFSI and uh, Prosperity Now engaged in this partnership, we had already been seeing a lot of questions from the field and, and me on my team and my work, we've been seeing some questions about uh, fintech and um, you know, there's an appetite to learn more and there's a lot going on in the field. Uh, and so we decided to put together this survey to sort of um, learn a little bit more about that and, and to gather information. So we set out to, um, with these three main learning objectives. First, we wanted to identify the organizations in the Prosperity Now network. And for the, in, in this phase, we focus specifically on this network, the Financial Coaching Network, um, that are providing FinTech products to uh, LMI clients. So next, uh, we wanted to gather information about those fintech products, so dive a little bit more deeply into um, how people are using products, how they approach it, uh, and what they're taking into account when they are adopting those products. And then finally, we wanted to learn about uh, network organizations' experiences, successes, challenges, and concerns uh, with fintech products and partnerships to spur adoption of fintech. So this was uh, a little bit more broad, um, just thinking about those who uh, don't currently provide fintech products and who do provide fintech products, just getting a sense of in general um, what what we're focusing on, what our concerns are, and what, what we should be taking into account, um, you know, for our sake, but also for your sake to make sure that we're delivering high quality products and we're able to, um, you know, reach as many people as possible. Um, so we can move to the next slide. Yeah, so when we set out to do this, um, we disseminated it to, to everybody in the network. We got 50 responses. Uh, and so uh, a few of you on the call might have seen the survey. Um, and we wanted to get a sense first of, so just sharing some of the data about who responded to the survey. Uh, we had 15 people in senior leadership uh, respond, 22 people in program management, seven people in frontline staff, and five people, people um, in other. So that included some coaches and some financial literacy uh, 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 teachers and, and that kind of thing. Next, we had the geographical distribution. So we had about 21 states represented and the top four were six from California, five from Texas, four from Minnesota and four from Florida. Uh, we had 16 organizations of color respond to the survey. Um, and of those, uh, I thought it was interesting that of those we had six that offered FinTech products to clients in some, uh, to some extent. And so I want to just highlight this data point and uh, go back to it later, um, because this is one of the feed into one of the takeaways from the survey. Of the final financial capability services provided, uh, we had, you know, no surprise, we disseminated it, uh, the survey to the financial coaching network that 44 out of the 50 provide financial coaching. So no surprise there. Um, 39 of you also provide financial education, uh, 23 provide credit building, and 23 provide Vita and TCE. Um, so these were the top four. And um, we also uh, focused on, asked about target populations. Uh, so if you're focusing specifically on uh, a group um, or if, it's, if that's part of your mission, and we had uh, 15 organizations that focus on specific groups. Um, of those, uh, I'll read a, a few of them. Uh, we had uh, organizations focus on Latino, serving Latino organizations, Haitians and Haitian Americans, Native Americans, refugees and immigrants, people of color, uh, foster youth, um, LMI people with thin or no credit history, uh, women and students. Um, so I thought that was very interesting as well. All right, moving on. So next we wanted to find out a little bit about your clientele. Um, so who you're serving and, and what their circumstances, what their situation is. So uh, 34 of you uh, that answered the, the survey serve more than 1,000 clients, um, which, is, which is the majority of you. Uh, percentage of clientele that are people of color, 25 of you, so half serve uh, of, your, of your clientele uh, is majority people of color. Where you're serving clients, so this is what this was a select all um, or select all options that apply. Uh, so 36 of you serve clients in urban areas, 27 of you serve clients in suburban areas, 25 of you serve clients in rural areas. Clients with internet access in the home. So this, um, these next two data points you'll see um, are reflected a little bit in some of the data that that Josh uh, shared, and 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 that was the aggregate data. Now we're looking a little bit of it, uh, some themes popping up with uh, the survey data. 
which is 26 of you, so over half of you, um, have uh, of your clients uh, within those 26, uh, more than half or everyone you serve have, uh, has internet access. And then clients with smartphones, um, 36 of you have a clientele of more than half of your clients or everyone that you serve uh, with smartphones. Um, so I would say a little bit, um, so it's ubiquitous. You can see, you know, 36 out of 50, but maybe not as ubiquitous uh, mobile phones as, as we think they are. And then um, even though a lot of people have mobile phones, they don't have a lot of uh, internet access. Okay. All right, so running through these really quickly. So some interesting, uh, I, I wanted to lift up some high level data points that um, uh, go into, feed into the takeaways from the survey. So you articulated your reasons for not offering FinTech products. So at this point we had two tracks and we had um, one track for people who don't offer FinTech products, another for people that do. And for those that didn't, we had 32 that responded that they didn't and the rest responded that they did. So this is for the no track. Um, the reasons for not offering FinTech products. Um, we had 19 people that have not identified the right FinTech tool for clients. So this is feeding into our, our I think, a broader theme into, of the survey and, and uh, that we saw in the poll questions, which is, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, knowledge to be gained here. Um, and a lot of you have uh, an appetite to, to learn more about FinTech. Um, the second part, uh, highest question was, have not identified FinTech provider partners or outside organizations that offer them. Um, so this could mean a couple of things. One is either you uh, have done your own research, but you don't know how, how to take the next step or feeding into this uh, high level sort of theme is, you know, we still lack information to feel confident about um, taking the, the next step. We still need to gather information. All right, the need that FinTech can address. Um, so similarly to the poll question that we asked earlier, um, the top two answers were uh, managing personal consumption um, or personal financial management. And then we had a tie there with uh, 24 about building financial knowledge, uh, building uh, and repairing credit score and increasing savings. Uh, so uh, interesting findings there. Barriers to impeding client access to FinTech products. So um, you all articulated that uh, the lack of trust and privacy concerns was number one. And this is interesting, um, I think another theme that that is articulated in here about, you know, lack of trust could stem from a number of things, you know, just some of the things, uh, it could be a lack of information. Um, it could be that uh, you've just heard, you know, uh, it, it's a different, the FinTech providers are, are a little bit of a different type of provider, different type of culture. Um, there might be mistrust with how, you know, they've been uh, portrayed in media or you just have, have had a bad, a bad experience with it. Um, but the number two answer was unfamiliarity with technology. So again, um, uh, lack of information here or um, appetite for more knowledge. All right, so moving on. So questions about FinTech. So uh, we asked you, you know, to uh, raise up questions that you wanted to ask of the experts, any questions or concerns that remained about FinTech. And this is again, with the group that answered uh, that they don't provide FinTech products. So in terms of product design, um, many of you, and I lifted up uh, some of the main quotes, but these were the three main th themes, um, that there were questions about product design. So how are FinTech providers, including the voice and needs and opportunities of the financially underserved and the designs? Uh, so, you know, thinking about process here, how are, how are FinTech des uh, product designers thinking about the needs and the circumstances of uh, the LMI population that you're serving? and how is that factoring in, into their design? Uh, so for privacy and security concerns, uh, we saw that reflected in the earlier survey question um, and the quote here on the screen, we want a FinTech uh, solution that doesn't harm our participants in any way, and we have concerns about privacy and avoiding fees, uh, that this is of paramount importance to them. Um, so, you know, I read this in two ways, that one can be, you know, just the, the harm that's caused from collecting pri uh, information that, you know, could be uh, shared with, pe with people that we don't want to share it with, or, um, you know, there's uh, cybersecurity concerns, but also, you know, uh, tied to product design, like how do we create, especially with, you know, loan products that have a little bit more risk, how do we create products that mitigate those risks or mitigate the harms and that really meet the needs of, of the client? 
Um, and then where to find and learn about uh, fintech products is another big theme in these in this section. Um, and the quote there, how does an organization get started on researching fintech tools that fit their scope of service? Uh, so again, going back to this um, theme of, you know, we want information, we want more, uh, uh, we want to know what, what else is going on, okay? So I am running out of time a little bit here, so I'm gonna speed up. Um, here are some of the, so now this was the track for those of you that do provide FinTech products. Um, so I'll just, um, you know, uh, show you that this is a, a short list of what we gathered. But, um, and I will mention that we will follow up um, with um, sending out these slides in, in a follow-up email. And I also mentioned that, you know, these aren't necessarily endorsed by Prosperity Now or CFSI. We're just sharing, you know, what you all, this is what you all are using in terms of products. Um, okay, and then how are your delivering uh, products? So 10 of you directly partner with a fintech provider to offer their product uh, to our clients. Um, how you selected these products. So, uh, you know, there was a little bit of just online research and some referrals from a partner, um, and there was some word of mouth there. All right, and then uh, partnership models. So partnership models varied, uh, and there was a high number of respondents that either referred clients to a publicly available product, so, you know, something that's online and you didn't necessarily have to uh, create a formal partnership or you received a grant su subsidy to provide the product. And then only one respondent has a revenue and data sharing agreement with a fintech provider. All right, Oper operationalizing a fintech product. Um, you know, eight of you, there's a question here that hopefully we get into, I think we'll get into a lot more later about how to roll out uh, the fintech product. Um, so. Uh, thinking about frontline staff, uh, support for your clients during the setup phase, and then challenges uh, experienced while offering a fintech product. Okay, and I'll just keep moving here. Financial outcomes. So we see that, um, you know, and the, uh, again, just a reminder, this is out of uh, uh, 18 of you that answered yes. Um, so five of you uh, saw increases in short-term savings, such as emergency savings, and five of you saw man uh, uh, positive outcomes in management of spending. All right, and finally, um, I'll just focus uh, one or two minutes on survey takeaways. So, you know, we saw that we still don't know a lot about FinTech products um, and that res respondents are hungry for more information and guidance around vetting. Uh, so, you know, this, there's, a, there's a big theme here and, and we see these in the polls and we see this in the survey that um, there's more information uh, that you all want and, and yearn for. Um, there are real concerns about privacy, about product design and sustainability of a fintech product. I think there was a question here, a very specific question around um, turnover of uh, fintech products so that there are a lot of companies that are starting but then that um, shut down after a couple of years. And so what happens when you engage with that fintech product um, and they might not, uh, you know, should, what questions should we be asking around like, you know, are they going to be around for the next few years and, and how to approach that? There's more work to, read, to be done around tracking outcomes and learning about fintech's uh, impact in the financial security of LMI people. You know, the, the survey data that we have is, is a small sample size. And I think, you know, we, on, we only saw a couple of uh, increases in uh, savings and in, and in managing your money. So I think there's more work to be done in, in terms of the analysis of what is the impact, what are the outcomes that can be achieved with fintech. Um, and then there's a lot of opportunity to serve LMI people, especially organizations serving people of color. Um, so, you know, half of you uh, have a clientele that's majority uh, people of color. Um, 16 of you are, are comprised of uh, your organization is, is, has leadership of people of color or a board of people of color. And so, um, you know, on, but only six of you of those provide uh, fintech products. So there's a lot of opportunity here to, um, you know, serve people who uh, might not have access to these products. Um, and then, but keeping that in account, uh, keep also keeping in account that some LMI clients are experiencing barriers that need to be addressed before adopting a fintech product. Um, so a lot of you mentioned that, you know, internet access. Uh, so a lot of people um, live in areas, um, particularly in some rural, rural areas where there isn't internet access. Um, where data is, you know, data on your phone isn't available, and then access to bank accounts. This is another big theme that people lift up around. You know, if someone doesn't have a bank account, how how can we get? Uh, does it make sense for uh, that individual to get a fintech product? How do we get? Like, what is the order of operations for uh, an individual to first get 
um, the bank account and then get the fintech product? And what are the considerations there? Do things need to be in place before a fintech product, uh, an individual is ready for a fintech product? So with that, um, I will, um, you know, take a, a, a transition and I'll turn it over back to Josh. But in the meantime, if you have, I'll just, you know, another quick reminder, if you have any questions, or if you have anything that you want to clarify, um, I encourage you to type into the chat box. We'll also have um, our Q&A section at the end, and I'm glad to answer any questions at that point. All right, and turning it over back to Josh. Fantastic. Thanks, Santi, for sharing. It'd be really helpful to set the tone of the conversation by hearing from the financial coaching community about their experiences to date and, and also the, uh, the perspective that many of you may have and some of the really great questions. I really love the thinking um, uh, that many of you are, are bringing to the table when it comes to exploring the opportunities and looking at the fintech space. Um, so now let's, let's uh, you know, after kind of getting that as a, as a baseline, uh, we can turn the tables and, and talk to a couple of providers of fintech tools uh, to kind of hear how they think about the opportunity and how they may have addressed some of these challenges that uh, we, uh, we identified via the survey work. So I'm going to turn to each of our panelists and ask them to give us about three to five minutes to, to introduce themselves and, and tell us a little bit more about their products and the work that they're doing and hear a little bit about their perspective on the role that fintech can play in supporting LMI clients and reaching uh, financial security. So uh, let's start with Yadi. Um, Yadi, can you tell us more about Lamando and, and how it supports LMI clients? Sure. Hi, everyone. Delighted to participate today. So I am the co-founder and CMO of Lamando, which is a fintech and social enterprise with the mission to provide everyone, regardless of their income, their credit history, or citizenship status with transparent and affordable financial services that help them save more of their hard-earned money, uh, build credit, and improve their overall financial health. So Lemondo's primary product is a zero-fee account that allows multiple ways to add funds, including loading a direct deposit of a paycheck or of government benefits, uh, taking a photo of a check and cash reload. And in addition, we have the ability to do peer-to-peer -peer transfers within the Lemondo platform. All of Lemondo services are fully bilingual in English and Spanish, and we pair the account with an app that provides users with financial literacy tutorials and tips. In addition, we're also offering other products to help folks build credit affordably and send remittances or international money transfers at half the cost of traditional providers and all from the app um, on people's smartphones. And I'd also like to reiterate that we take flexible documentation to enroll for Lemondo. So uh, an individual can sign up with a social, an ITIN, a state ID or state driver's license, um, matricula consular mexicana, or even a foreign passport. So we work really hard to eliminate uh, what we see as the two big barriers to accessing an account, which are the financial costs. So we made our account zero fee, so there's no overdraft, no fee to sign up, no minimum balance, or you have to link a direct deposit in order for the account to be free. And then we take flexible documentation, so citizenship status isn't a barrier to having an account. And I'd also like to share that I actually started my career working in nonprofit, and so I provided case management services in the different areas of life skills to current and former foster youth and their families. So I worked on the front lines and know the issues that um, LMA, LMI families are facing. And so I worked really hard to build a product that services this community specifically. Fantastic. Thanks, Yadi, for the, the introduction. Um, and Megan, I'd love to hear a little bit about the financial clinic. I know you, you all do some really interesting work, not only in building and managing the change machine platform and working with uh, organizations to, um, to, to implement that, but also in partnering with other fintech providers. I'd love to hear a little bit more about, uh, about your work and um, how you view the opportunity to support LMI communities. Yes, thanks so much, Josh. Um, it's great to be here today with all of you, um, really thinking about how we connect this 
good practice of financial coaching with fintech products out there in the market. Um, also, just really excited to to be able to speak with Yachty and learn more about their product at Lamondo. Um, but my name is Megan Kersick. I am the Assistant Director of Partnership Management for the Financial Clinic. And the clinic, we are a national nonprofit uh, focused on helping working poor families achieve financial security. So we have a few different areas of service. We do provide um, direct services, one-on-one -on -one financial coaching in New York City. Um, we also provide training and capacity building supports for other nonprofits to, to do the work of financial security building services. But then where I'll really focus today is on our social enterprise, which is Change Machine. So Change Machine is a fin fintech product, um, and but it's a little different than how I think a lot of us kind of classically think about fintech. Um, I don't know if fintech has been around long enough to say classically, but I'm going to use it. Um, and so we, we usually think about fintech in this business to consumer space, right? So a B2C model where or the, the products really focus on helping consumers improve their finances in some way or improve their financial behavior in some way. But we are a product that is business to business, so a B2B model um, that is focused in on helping to improve the actual delivery of financial coaching services. So we see technology as having a lot of potentials um, to impact uh, low and moderate income populations. But through our product, it's essentially like one step away in that we're helping coaches to improve their, their practice, to improve coaching, and then that's what helps those consumers to really better their financial security. So um, just to overview the ways that we've focused in at Change Machine on um, using technology to support coaching. Um, first, increasing access to training and resources. So we have online training in our financial security framework, as well as downloadable tip sheets and worksheets for your customers all in one platform so you have that like at your fingertips um, in real time access to those resources. Um, we also see technology as an opportunity to break down like historic physical barriers to a peer community. So we've got just over 1100 people on Change Machine and we created a social network for them. So you no longer have to like have someone sitting at the desk desk next to you providing coaching, but you can connect to over a thousand people across the country providing coaching to share ideas, ask questions, things like that. Um, and then finally, we really see a lot of potential uh, for technology to improve our ability to collect data and then there therefore evaluate our program. So we thought a lot about user experience. How do you streamline data collection really in the coaching session versus something you have to do after the fact? Um, can data collection actually kind of help facilitate a, a session too? So really kind of step, taking a step back and, and seeing how we can integrate data collection with session delivery. But then finally, by really improving the quality of data that we are able to gather through the practice of coaching, uh, we see a lot of potential to look at that aggregate data um, in the space that we call lasting change. So where can we see opportunities for policy and product solutions to the things that are coming up in our coaching data? Um, so again, we focus in on that B2B space um, through our product change machine. Um, and then I will pause here for now, but really excited that in the panel discussion, I can get a little bit into how we've thought about those B2C models and integrating um, referrals to B2C fintech products um, through our own coaching services. Um, but I will pause there. Fantastic. Thanks, Megan, for the overview. Very helpful. Um, so let's dive in. You know, I, I want to spend a little bit of time. I've got some, some questions that I'd like to, to ask Yadi and Megan uh, to kind of learn a little bit more about their experience, where they're seeing some opportunities and challenges. And, and uh, then, as Santi mentioned, we will open things up um, to the attendees. So remember to continue submitting your questions, um, and we'll be able to have a, a broader discussion. Um, but now that we're familiar a bit more with the, the, the products and the work that you're doing, it'd be great to hear a little bit more about your overall experience, namely the receptivity to fintech tools by um, the, the products you're, you're offering by some, some clients. And, uh, you know, we can look at that question in two different ways, given that uh, Lamando is more of a, a B2C um, a product with um, a change machine being a B2B. So, Yadi, I'd love to start with you and just anything you can tell us about the overall experience you've had from clients thus far, maybe ways that they're using your product, feedback that you've gotten, and have you seen that there's been any real tangible impact on 
um, you know, people being able to improve the way that they're managing their money and their overall financial health? Sure, absolutely. So it's been really exciting to see that users are using Lemondo uh, for a variety of needs, whether it's to get their government benefits uh, via direct deposit or to uh, take advantage of the ca check capture capability um, when they have their part of the gig economy, for example. And uh, overall, I would say that they are very excited about this new tool. There's definitely a trust barrier that we have to overcome, one, because of their experiences with traditional financial institutions sometimes, and also because this is a very new and different type of product. Uh, we're technology first, and so it's getting people to wrap their heads around uh, relying heavily on technology to manage their finances, but I would say overall, uh, people are delighted to hear that there's no fees, that we're, we advocate that we're transparent and affordable, and um, once they, that is pretty clear, uh, we find that folks are very receptive to our product. Fantastic. And Megan, similar question um, for you in terms of your interaction and engagement in um, offering Change Machine to financial coaching organizations, what kind of feedback are you getting and, and what do you think generally in the way that uh, people are receiving the, the, the tool and, and the way that they're using it? Yeah, definitely. So um, I think that kind of generally speaking, when people hear about the opportunity to apply technology to their work and really like improve their experience. At first, people are really excited, right? And I think we kind of have this like just belief in technology as being like always a, a solution and always like something that's going to like increase our productivity, right? But then when we've dug into like our, our actual interactions with folks on Change Machine, I think what um, we've found, and, and I actually think this applies in the B2C space as well as the B2B space, is at the end of the day, uh, the technology really does have to work well for that, that customer, right, or that client. And so um, we've really focused in on how do we ensure first that the, that the uh, change machine um, product is a fit. And I think it's important to kind of remember, to take a step back um, and, I, and, and just remember that it's not a one size fits all option, right, for any technology or any FinTech product. Um, there's no sil silver bullet. And so we really have to find a product that fits, if we're thinking on the B2C space, those consumer needs um, specific to that individual consumer, as well as in the B2B space, um, making sure that Change Machine is a fit for the actual uh, program model that's being implemented by um, by a, a nonprofit, and so um, so that's kind of been like the first thing is let's just make sure we're aligned in our goals and really how you see this as being a, a tool to improve your practice. Um, and then the second piece of this is just like really digging in to make sure that people understand how the product works. Um, and that the product continues to evolve and refine itself to be a better fit for those for those um, clients on the system. Um, so we've built out some training solutions. So we ensure that right from the beginning, people can get on the change machine and kind of get in there and practice and make sure that when they are then out in the field coaching directly with customers, um, change Machine isn't this additional burden, but they've been able to practice like really making it a streamlined part of their session delivery. So um, I think it's, it's there's not like an answer like yes or no, people are receptive. It's really about uh, the individuals, whether it's the consumers or the organizations in our, in, in our case. Um, is it is the product a fit for their needs? And then once we know it's a fit, is the product designed, is our training designed in a way that truly allows them to maximize the um, opportunities available on that platform? That's great. That's great. And, and, a, and a quick follow-up question there. Um, you know, what, this kind of gets to, I think, your, your, your point around making sure that the, the, the tool is actually going to be a fit for the, the way that the organizations are engaging with clients. 
do you see, um, you know, asked for or is Change Machine equipped with things that are customizable for different populations um, in which may influence how a coaching program is run? So, for instance, we got a couple of questions around things like um, just, uh, uh, you know, are tools translated? Are they, they um, um, relevant linguistically in, in, in different languages so that, that they could be used? I'm curious if in the organizations you're working with, I'm guessing each of them may have a different model for coaching based on who their end user is and the extent to which change machine is either customizable or the way that you may work with some of those partners to, uh, you know, ensure that, um, um, that, that the tool can really be adapted for their situation and, and for their client base. Yeah, so I think like any good product, like especially in the technology space, is continually getting information from their users, right? And so we have a few different ways that we gather information from our users to then build out pieces of the platform that can be customized to their work. And so um, I can get into some of the specifics. One of the ways that we've done that is um, in the, you know, as we like onboard people onto the system, we're tracking different, or what we call organization demographics. So we're understanding like, you know, how many change machine users are delivering workforce programs and embedding financial coaching with workforce? How many are in the um, housing services space or the reentry space? Um, and so then with that, we're developing customized training content on Learn as well as customized tools um, in those areas. We have something we call pathways. So we like highlight for folks when, um, what are the different sort of like topic areas or customer groups that we have special content for. And then you can sort our training content and our tools by those pathways. Um, and then we've also got, you know, definitely been focused in on uh, the languages that are being spoken by the, like, kind of like the people we are one step away from, the customers of those coaching programs. And so we're in the midst of building out all of our um, uh, customer tools in Spanish, and then we're eventually gonna move on to other languages um, that first are the sort of main languages spoken in New York City and continue to sort of crowdsource what should be next in that space. Um, but we definitely have content customized to different programs and different customer types. Um, and it's ever evolving. And it's, again, I started with that point, but I think that's like most important is that you constantly have these feedback loops to better understand the needs of your customer base and you're able to continue to refine and customize your platform to better serve them. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, I love that phrase, feedback loop, right? And I think it's so important when you think about the opportunities for um, tech providers and developers like uh, the Financial Clinic and, and their customers and, and nonprofit organizations more generally. It's you look at that continual refinement of when we hear something maybe working or not working or there's a need um, uh, for, for that to get you know, fed back into the design process. Um, Yadi, I want to circle back to you. In, in one of your in, in your response, you mentioned something about building trust, right? And, and, and the receptivity to uh, Lamando, often including having to get over some initial um, mistrust from clients and or customers that they, they may not really be sure about it. Can you talk us, you know, dive a little bit deeper into that and talk about what that looks like and some of the things that you do to help build trust with with your uh, with your customers? Absolutely. So, in addition to doing B two C direct to the uh, customer, we also do B two B, but it's really uh, with nonprofits. So, we make an intentional effort to build mission aligned partnerships with nonprofits that are serving um, LMI and underserved communities. And the way that we do that is uh, by doing a train the trainer. So. Um, nonprofits are the folks on the ground that really have a holistic view of their constituents, um, basically life and financial health. And so it's really designed so that um, case managers, for example, know about Lemondo and can share that resource with their clients. And then it truly is a partnership. So like Megan was talking about the feedback loop, that's the relationship that we build with nonprofits because this product is designed for these customers. And so we want our product to be useful to them and helping them accomplish the things that they want to do. So we definitely advocate for hearing feedback about what's working and what's not and what we can do better. Terrific, terrific. 
Um, so yeah, you know, you mentioned the, the, the kind of partnerships, and I want to jump uh, to, to spend a little bit of time um, discussing uh, discussing that partnership question. Um, Yada, can you tell us a little bit more about you know how are you finding these partners that you work with, and, and kind of what the conversation looks like um, as you're thinking about the the opportunities to look uh, to work with them. You know, what do you value? Do they really get out of working with you, and what value do you get out of uh, out of working with them? Yeah, so initially we were rolling out in the greater Southern California area, and um, I was really fortunate that since I started my career in nonprofit and I've been an avid volunteer, even when I worked in the corporate sector, I had a really robust network of nonprofits that I interacted and worked with. So it was really calling up people that I knew and telling them about what we were doing and sitting down to see what is the best way to implement Lemando into their work, um, depending on their the robustness of their financial literacy, financial empowerment programming. So what we see is that nonprofits, there's a wide range of, they have either formal financial literacy and empowerment programs, or they run VITA, for example, uh, to where they just don't have the capacity. And so we really sit down to work with them to figure out what is the easiest way that we can have Lemondo be another tool in their toolkit in servicing their clients. So in that sense, it would, it's really bespoke depending on the partners. Um, and, but what we have, and then the kind of nonprofits we work with are across the spectrum, but the bulk of them are ones that are delivering services around uh, housing and workforce development, but really the kind of partnerships we have are across the board. And then it's also, it varies what kind of needs they're trying to address, whether it's credit building either for personal needs or starting a business or expanding their business to getting, accessing their uh, public benefits more quickly and efficiently to you know, they these individuals may not be um, interested in a traditional bank account because they're wary of the fees, like the overdraft fees and other things like that. Great, thank you. Uh, and looking at this question of partnerships in a little bit of a different light, um, Megan, I think one of the interesting things about Change Machine and the work Financial Clinic is doing is not only is it a platform uh, to provide some some training and, and materials and support services for financial coaches, but also um, you've been exploring some partnerships with other fintech providers, right, to uh, potentially um, uh, refer or, or help coaches connect their clients with some of the tools that may may be uh, a good fit for the people that they're working with. You know, the, the work with Earn kind of comes to mind. Can you talk a little bit more about what that, uh, that those kind of partnerships look like in the vetting process? I think there's some questions for a lot of organizations around how do you know if it's a good product, right? How do I know that this is something that I want to work with? Curious to hear a little bit more about uh, the financial clinics uh, approach. Yeah, so um, in our coaching practice in New York, but then also um, the sort of framework that our coaches our, our coaches sort of coach within and then what we built change machine sort of stemming from we have six different financial security areas and we've defined um, quantified outcome measures for those areas as well as like the set of action steps that customers go through to get there and so when we kind of think about um, like like more formal partnership what types of fintech products um, might we want to have like direct even referral partnerships with um, it would it would be those in the in those six areas that that should in some way help our customers to um, achieve the different action steps that are going to lead to an outcome and so that's kind of how we would initially like think about who could be a good partner um, and so you mentioned earn and they're a really wonderful example because two of our um, six financial security areas are goals and assets and so what we loved about Earn Starter Savings Program is that many of our customers are getting are getting their kind of foot in the door when it comes to planning um, first for emergency savings and then some longer term savings beyond that. Um, and so the fact that the Earn Starter Savings Program um, could reward people for their savings behavior was really great, really reinforced the action steps that we were walking through with our customers and supporting our customers to achieve um, in each of their individual action plans. 
Uh, we also appreciated how with that product, they, they had attention to people's personal financial goals. And that's, again, one of our six financial security areas. So it was great that we had kind of like a one-two punch with the goals and the assets um, uh, within our framework. Um, so that's kind of how we might go about like who could be a potential partner. But then when we get down to the vetting, um, you know, lots of kind of granular steps, but the three major things that we want to work through with a potential partner are three major questions. Um, so first, how does the company make money? <laughs> and that will really like digging into their business model. So, um, you know, what sort of are their motives for designing the product and, and therefore helping you to kind of predict like whether or not it's going to be a product that you feel responsible in maybe referring a customer to. The second major question is what does the company do with customer data? Um, so I won't go down the rabbit hole of like all of the different ways you want to look into um, financial or data security, but um, understanding when people do input some of their own data into a FinTech product, what is the company going to do with it and being able to inform customers so they can make an educated decision on whether or not they feel comfortable um, working with that product. Um, and then the final question um, is we want to get at, um, and this is a little harder maybe to get somebody to answer or truly know the answer to for their for their product, but we want to know their expected lifetime. So how long have they been around? Um, so really, like how long have, do they have like an evidence base for um, their um, like quality of service? But then also like what are their longer term goals? Like do they just want to get bought up by a major financial institution? And making sure that we have a sense when we recommend products to folks, um, you know, how long they can even expect that it's going to look the same or exactly, you know, have the same business model. So we look at those kind of three major questions to start our vetting process. Um, and then as an aside, another thing we do is um, we've definitely found that it is important to have products be tried and tested by our own coaches. And so um, coaches will also be usually like the best champion if they've used the product and it's worked for them. So we also have our coaches actually, um, you know, sign up for whatever products we might be referring to or um, kind of have in our toolbox for potential customers. Um, to use and actually have our coaches go through that process and see if it works, see how their customer experience was. Um, so that's generally speaking how we go through that um, first thinking about who is a good partner, but then starting to vet their product and their business model and whether or not it's a fit for our customers. Fantastic. Thanks, Megan. I really love that that list, right? You know, some really um, practical questions that people can answer and things to explore when uh, looking at some some tools they might want to uh, to bring into the fold. Um, so let's move to the the audience Q and A. I know we've been getting some some good questions, and I'm guessing some of you had some more. So I'm going to turn it over to the uh, Prosperity Now team to uh, give you some some instructions there and kick us off. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, so thanks so much to our panelists, um, Josh and Megan and Yadi. That was great. And I um, appreciate you taking the time to answer these questions. I know a lot of the questions you were talking to and answering were questions that our um, you know, attendees and we heard the survey were bringing up. So I really appreciate that. Um, now we're going to turn to the, the larger audience um, Q&A. And so to ask a question, I know a lot of you have already been chatting. I see my colleagues um, in the room right now. Um, gathering your, your questions um, for our panelists. Um, keep sending those in. Um, and if you have an interest in um, you know, joining the conversation, you also have the ability to raise your hand and we can unmute you to join. Um, so we are, so here's the, the instructions on the screen. If you want to raise your hand, there's the, the handprint on the, the toolbox. Um, you push that and we can unmute you. But as a reminder, um, you need to be connected by telephone and enter your audio pin. Otherwise, send in your chat. So with that, let's um, turn it to the group discussion. And Josh, to, to start it off, um, there was a question that, that came in. Um, so I, I know we have some coming into the chat box. I can read, a, um, read one of them right now. Um, and this was specifically for, for you, Yadi. Um, there's two questions. One was, what kind of interest do you offer on Lamondo's credit builder loans? Or is there interest associated with it? And the second question is, um, do you offer and what kind of, and if so, what kind of financial education do you provide with your credit builder loans or your prepaid card products? 
Yes, so uh, I'll start off with saying that we are actually part of the state of California's responsible small dollar loan pilot program, which has two uh, primary requirements. The first is that we're capped at credit card interest rates versus a payday lender interest rate. So it's essentially saying we are not a payday lender. And the, that tool is going to be launched at the end of the year. And so we're still working out the credit model, but essentially it'll be anywhere from 3% to 25%. And the great thing about that is that these are gonna be micro loans. So it's to get people an emergency loan um, to, in case they have an emergency and or if they want to use it to build their credit but it, it's going to be five hundred dollars and below so it won't put people into deeper debt and the great thing is if they want to reborrow from Lemondo after they've paid off their first loan successfully the interest rate will go down and they can borrow a greater amount and that whole time we're reporting to the credit agency so this will help someone build their credit and then the other aspect of being in the in this state program is that there's the financial literacy requirement, which we already meet because we push out notifications via SMS and through the app, giving people information. It's um, basic, but things that they want to know about, um, for example, encouraging to uh, save uh, for an emergency fund. Um, information about how to build your credit or things that they've expressed interest in. So we do it through the app and via SMS. Um, and that's how we deliver financial literacy at the moment. Awesome. Thanks for that, Yadi, and sharing your, your perspective and how you're um, approaching um, that kind of work. Appreciate that. And, and Josh, there's a question here about that um, partnerships have been mentioned around fintech with nonprofits. And I know Megan talked about this a little bit with Change Machine. And I was wondering with your experience, Josh, with working with you know multiple um, fintech providers as well as nonprofits, um, can answer this question of, you know, how does a partnership typically work? And, and does the company, the fintech provider, need to be a nonprofit, especially when we're thinking about like credit restoration or credit building? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think there's a few different models for how, how partnerships can, can work. And, and we've seen a few uh, come through our, our uh, the FinTech Nonprofit Partnerships Working Group. Uh, I think that the, probably the, the, the most simple one that we are not simple, but <laughs> it's actually quite complicated, but kind of the more basic or um, um, a typical uh, type of, of partnership is a nonprofit is distributing a, a product that is being offered by a FinTech provider doesn't always have to be a nonprofit organization, what we've seen, um, especially with some of the, the financial solutions lab companies we've worked with. Um, most of them are, are for-profit entities, um, but they are still able to work effectively with nonprofits to distribute a tool. Um, that's where you know those kind of um, vetting points that, that Megan mentioned become very important for the nonprofits to really understand Okay, what are the company's motivations? What are the fee structures? How are how does the company make money? Um, how are the data being protected? And make sure that um, the company's incentive to grow and to be profitable is not interfering uh, with the the uh, the goal of having a, a client improve their overall financial health. It's doable, and I think that vetting process is really important. Um, other partnerships are, are are larger scale. We've seen organizations coming together, a fintech provider and a, a, a nonprofit working together to maybe to co-brand a, a product or, or, or create a new one. Um, there's a, a, um, a great partnership that's been happening with a company called EarnUp, who creates kind of a, a credit um, a debt optimization platform, they, they call it essentially. If you've got a bunch of loans, they'll pull out of each paycheck the amount that needs to pay it. So it just kind of helps the people to stay on top of that and um, um, build in some self-discipline. But they've been working with GreenPass, um, who's uh, one of the, the nation's largest credit counselors, uh, to develop a, a payment plan system for many of its clients and customers. So a more in-depth uh, relationship in, in that end. So, you know, we've seen a, a lot of different types of, of partnerships, ways that organizations are coming together. I think what's really important 
um, is that both uh, sides of, of the equation, the FinTech provider, whether they're for-profit or non-profit, uh, and the, the direct service community organizations are having a pretty open and honest conversation about what they're both looking to get out of that partnership um, and, you know, what are the, the red lines, the things that are just not okay. Um, and then if they can find ways to work together after that, then, you know, we've seen that there's some real uh, opportunity for, for mutually beneficial um, solutions and, and really powerful combinations uh, that, that help end users and, and clients uh, move the needle on their financial health. Um, Thanks for that. It's really helpful to have your experience working with all these different types of, of companies um, around this work. Um, there's a question that is, is specific around kind of a match component, especially how, um, you know, a product that provides a savings account with a match um, could be helpful for coaching programs. And so the question came in kind of wanting to know if anyone um, on the call or anyone in the audience um, has experience collaborating with um, a financial institution or a fintech provider um, through technology to provide a savings account with a match component as an incentive specifically for financial coaching programs to use. Um, I think this is probably, it, it actually makes me think of the, the EARN model. Um, I know they were a part of um, the Financial Solutions Lab. So I'm wondering, um, you know, I'd love to, you know, hear from anyone on the call about your experience, but um, while people are thinking, um, and if, Josh, if you could talk a little bit about the EARN model and if you've seen how it, how it could potentially work um, with financial coaching programs or how they could incorporate it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm sure Megan's got some, some good insight there as well, so I'll be happy to, to um, let, let her answer. But yeah, you know, EARN, I think the, the beauty of EARN, and I think a lot of what you'll find with nonprofit fintech providers is most of them were uh, born out of um, uh, direct service organizations that recognize the need, right? And the work that they, they've done, the financial clinic has been a, uh, um, a real pioneer in the financial coaching space, which gave them the kind of insights to develop change machine in much in the same way Earn was a real leader in the IDA match savings space for, for years before they realized that uh, there was an opportunity to build a tech platform uh, to help them increase their scale, increase their efficiency, increase their reach, and help other organizations to, uh, uh, to, to manage and, and, and support their, their customers and clients with uh, match savings opportunities. So the way that the, the platform had developed is called Saver Life. Um, it's essentially a, a platform people sign up. Uh, the one thing that's probably a little bit different here from a typical IDA program is that uh, EARN doesn't provide the savings account. Um, the clients essentially have to come to the table with one, um, but they will, will be able to put in their information and essentially kind of link to the EARN platform. And once they do that, um, EARN can pull in that account data on an ongoing basis to see what people's savings, goal, um, savings activity and balances are. Um, you know, so if you set a goal, they can kind of tell you where you are in terms of your progress. Uh, and then over a certain period of time, if people meet certain savings um, uh, benchmarks, then they get a match. A match comes in from EARN um, to reward them from savings for saving much in the way that an IDA program would. And so the platform provides that engagement model. Um, you know, there are some, some tips from uh, a financial coach that they, they work with and um, uh, some real fun incentives, some, some gamification elements to kind of help pe keep people motivated. Um, as, a, as a part uh, of, of their savings goal. So, you know, it, it helps to keep people on board, helps to keep people engaged. So as a corollary to that match savings program where you may be working with someone individually, but once they walk out of a session, right, or once they, I think they kind of leave your offices, what is that tool that can help to keep them on track, help to keep them really motivated and excited? This is a great platform um, to, uh, to, to bring to the table. Uh, Megan, I don't know if you have any other uh, thoughts or, or um, kind of, uh, you know, around what that kind of partnership can look like based on your your interactions with them? Yeah, no, I would just say that I, I do think one of potentially most excite like the most exciting opportunities that I've seen with um, FinTech and like FinTech by nonprofits is the EARN product and um, really just thinking even more broadly than their product, specifically with match savings, the opportunity, now that we have this technology to like overlay with people's own accounts to truly scale up access to match savings. Um, I think what we know that IDAs work, um, what has been difficult in terms of thinking about scale is like how do you afford the match and like the um, and the um, sort of like rigorous uh, support services and like validation um, that's often required um, from like our historical match savings programs. And so the opportunity to be able to use like, you know, essentially the same technology and like 
you know, mint overlaying with your uh, accounts to actually identify when people can earn a match is really great. And that's not just to like get it out there to more people, but also to open up an opportunity to test different types of matches, right? So um, I know lots of different groups, I'm sure including CFSI have already looked at this, but even within your own program, does it make, you know, our customers more engaged by like, you know, smaller matches, but more regularly um, provided? Um, or do they want to see like a big match at the end of a longer period of time? Like it, now that we have this technology, we can test so many different approaches. So I think it's a really great opportunity that this idea of FinTech is really created for the asset building field. Great, so this is Santi. We have um, another question that uh, is, is building off of some of the, the discussion around uh, feedback loops and how you communicate with clients and how you uh, use that to inform your, your product design and also get past you know building, uh, building trust. But um, there is a question here um, that is asking to elaborate a little bit more around that. And specifically, you know, we have a lot of people on the line that are program managers and frontline staff. So getting really into, you know, not just in your, um, the interface that you have on your website um, or on, on your, in your app, but also thinking about what is, uh, what, what do you take into consideration when you're thinking about language, when you're thinking about, um, you know, how to communicate with clients, how to make sure that, um, the uh, what is the responsibility of the staff person or the person who's rolling out the uh, the product in terms of training the client in terms of offering them support? What have you seen around that and uh, and and in the communication? So what goes into that in in, in like specific terms? Um, for so this is for uh, Yadi and then uh, Megan. If you have um, insight in this, we'd love to hear from you too. But uh, let's start with Yadi. Okay, so feedback loops. So um, let me actually start with the building trust aspect. We think that it's really, really important to have the staff buy-in. And we think that after we get vetted really thoroughly that the nonprofits are pretty comfortable with understanding what our product really offers and what's behind the curtains, so to speak. And if there's still some lingering questions, we really say, you know, you can sign up for an account yourself and take a look at the statements and, and see if it's really what we pitch Lemondo to be. Um, and then we also make sure that we um, are sensitive in the language. So it's neutral and it doesn't put anyone like on the defensive or um, almost like we, we, we want to use language that's empowering and more like this is a tool that ha can help you access the things that you want or need as opposed to um, coming from a place of authority and saying that we know your personal situation and we can help help you. Um, but I, I think I would need a little bit more clarification on what the question is specifically about um, regarding the feedback loops. I don't know if there was any follow-up with that as to if it's feedback like directly from the customer or from the nonprofit. Yeah, so I think this is where, you know, when we're having these discussions, it does get, a, there, there are layers here that, uh, that make it a little bit more complicated. I think um, you know, the, the person who asked this question clarified a little bit more. So maybe if we, if we could pivot for a moment on um, how you're communicating in terms of uh, how you use that, how that information could be useful um, to your networks. So is the information shared on social media, on newsletters, and how are successes shared? Um, so yeah, just pivoting a little bit in terms of that framing. So we use a variety of ways to get Lemondo out, um, but right, the bulk of our work is really um, in person. So again, it goes back to the building trust. So we have sit down conversations with the nonprofit so that they can get a good understanding and see who is running um, Lemondo and really get an understanding of where we're coming from and our intention with building Lemondo and the products for their constituents. And um, as far as getting the word out 
it's very organic. Uh, we do rely on social media and we're going to be rolling out more campaigns over the next coming months. So really relying on PR and more online advertising. But we also understand that we have to reach customers where they are and a bulk of them are probably getting services through the nonprofit. So we rely as well pretty significantly on having the nonprofit help us with the outreach. And that's because we have built a, a good trusting partnership with the nonprofit and the nonprofit can say to their constituents, we know about Lemondo and we've vetted them very thoroughly and we believe that this is a product that can help you. So that's really, really important to us. Thanks for that, Yadi, and thanks for um, staying with us on the on the pivot and being able to to speak to that and how you market. Um, we have we only have a couple more minutes left, and I know if um, you know before we close and go into next steps, if there's anything you know last like Megan or Yadi or Josh um, that you'd want to share with the audience, if there's you know a, a resource or something you'd recommend people to check out. Um, or look up or look into or a piece of advice that you'd, that you'd want to share before we close? This is Megan. I can jump in really quick. Um, it's actually just, it's kind of like a follow-up to Yadi's last answer. Um, I think she did a wonderful job of kind of talking through the like qualitative um, feedback opportunities with your partners. But I think Another thing to recognize with fintech and then being a nonprofit potentially using a fintech product like Change Machine or where you have like the ability to access data from other products you might be partnering with is that you also can use that data to better understand your customers as well as if your services are a fit. And so just some really simple examples, but it's like even just demographics wise, um, if you have a majority of your customers like below uh, high school or GED equivalent and your customer tools are written at the 12th grade level, like you know there's a mismatch, right? If you are thinking about language and you're collecting like primary, primary language in the home, like you could feel good about having resources in English and Spanish, but what if 25% of your customer base speaks Arabic? And so um, I would just like also, you know, call out that the, the, promise of using this data that opens up with application of fintech in provision of financial coaching services really can help you with not just having like qualitative approaches to getting feedback but actually using your data to refine how you deliver services and making sure that your services are a best fit to your customer base yeah that's great thanks megan thanks for those insights Sure, and uh, I'll just touch upon that point about data. So I think it is really important to also delve into what fintechs are doing with customers' data, uh, especially um, in the current climate. We see what can happen when an uh, organization isn't really careful or prioritizing um, customers' privacy. And we here at Lemondo, we find that protecting our customers' private information is very important, and we make sure to emphasize that throughout our materials and our website and when having discussions with our nonprofit partners. So, for example, we don't participate in affiliate marketing. We don't sell our data or share our data with third parties aside from our partners to conduct our internal business processes. And so I think that's really, really important to highlight and be aware of what the uh, potential partner organizations are doing with clients' data. So we want to use the data for good and to be helpful to nonprofits and the end consumer, um, but also taking account about their privacy. Yeah. Yadi, um, thanks for saying that. I know the um, survey results that Santi was sharing earlier in the call kind of showed that uh, you know a lot of people who were tuning in today or took the survey that it's one of the one of the top things on their mind was concern about about privacy um, of their clients and security. So I, I really appreciate you speaking to that. Um, before we close, Josh, is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, 
you know, overall, this has been a really fantastic conversation. And I'm looking forward to continuing it all, um, both offline and um, hopefully, uh, again, directly with, with the Prosperity Now community. Um, but, you know, if you're thinking about you know, opportunities to, to, to pull in FinTech products into your space, I think one of the best pieces of advice I could give is um, just try it, right? Um, even if it's, it's you individually or one of your coaches, um, or picking one or two of your clients and just getting a sense for what they like um, and what they don't like about a particular product. I think oftentimes we see a lot of hesitance. Understandably so, you want to do thorough vetting if you're putting together a, a full program, but if you see a product and you just want to get a better sense if it's going to be a good fit for your client, the best way to answer that question is to try it. Um, and so, you know, I, I certainly encourage people as you're thinking about this, uh, this opportunity to, to do some exploration and, and if you and, and if you find something that you like or don't like, um, also this type of community, this type of um, a group coming together to share their experiences, I think will be immensely valuable um, so that, you know, everybody isn't starting from scratch. So um, I'm looking forward again to uh, continuing the conversation and yeah, thanks everybody for, for the time. Awesome. Thanks so much, Josh. Thank you, um, Josh and Yadi and Megan. Just really appreciate you being with us today and sharing your perspectives. And thanks everyone for, for tuning in and asking questions and being engaged throughout today's call. Um, we're about to end the webinar and when I do so, a survey will pop up. Let us know what you thought about today. Send us your feedback, what you liked, what you didn't like. We, we use that for future calls. Um, let us know your, success, your suggestions for future topics for the Financial Coaching Network. Um, and in there, it's an opportunity to volunteer to, to present or facilitate a future call. We're always looking for new people to engage in, in these speaking positions and, and sharing with the network. So let us know if you'd be interested in doing so. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, and happy Valentine's Day. Um, appreciate you all tuning in on Valentine's Day and, so, and showing your love for financial coaching. All right, everyone. Hope you have a great afternoon. We'll talk to you later.